A spinal tap is commonly done to confirm a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. But what is a spinal tap? How is it done? What are the risks and how is it interpreted? I'll explain all of that in this video. Let's have some fun. I'm Brandon Bieber and I make videos about multiple sclerosis every Wednesday. So please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. So a spinal tap is a procedure designed to get cerebrospinal fluid to send to the lab to help diagnose certain neurological conditions. And as you can see in the diagram in the left bottom corner, a needle is inserted into the spinal column into an area called the subarachnoid space to draw out the spinal fluid. Now it's a little bit technically difficult because it is a blind procedure. It can be done by radiologists using x-rays called fluoroscopy, but there is some radiation exposure, so we usually avoid that unless it's actually necessary to do that. It can be difficult to perform in people who have had prior spine surgery, who have severe arthritis or scoliosis. The most common risk of the procedure by far is that you can get leakage of the spinal fluid because you're creating a defect with the needle. And because of that, the pressure in the cerebrospinal fluid drops, and you can actually get headache that typically occurs when you're standing up. So the typical story will be the patient will sit up and get a severe headache and have to lie back down. And if that occurs, the first thing to do is to lie down and see if it goes away. You can also try drinking a lot of caffeine, which can sometimes close the defect. But if it doesn't go away, there's another procedure called a blood patch, where blood is injected into the area to seal the defect. Now, otherwise, the risks of the procedure are relatively minimal, although there are extremely rare cases of serious bleeding or nerve injury or infection. The risk is similar to getting epidural anesthesia for childbirth. In that procedure, we're giving medication, but in this procedure, we're taking fluid for diagnostic reasons. Now, the next slide I'm going to show does show a person getting a spinal tap. It's not too graphic, but if you're squeamish, you may want to skip ahead by about 20 seconds. So this is kind of what a spinal tap looks like. We sterilize the area, we put in the needle, and then we draw out the fluid. So what is cerebrospinal fluid? Well, it's ultimately formed from the blood. It's sort of an ultrafiltrate of the blood, and it's formed by the choroid plexus, which has these ependymal cells that form cerebrospinal fluid. And it has these tight junctions between the cells that regulate the fluid, so they have to go through the cell. The ultrafiltrate has to essentially go through the barrier of cells. And there are various complicated mechanisms to specifically make cerebrospinal fluid. And it basically functions to physically support the brain. It provides nutrients and hormones. And it's formed by both passive and active transport systems within the cells. A few of the examples of such symptom systems are shown here. Now, if we look at the flow of cerebral spinal fluid, we can see that it's formed in the choroid plexus in the lateral ventricles and the fourth ventricle. And it spreads over the subarachnoid spaces throughout the brain. And it actually gets back into the venous structures in the head through arachnoid granulations. And you can sort of see those protrusions known as arachnoid granulations into the dural venous sinuses, and the blood then flows back to the heart. And if we were sort of to strip away all of the brain and skull and uh, meninges, we would see what the cerebrospinal fluid pathway looks like. And of course, this is just a two-dimensional view. The subarachnoid space is all over the brain. Now you can actually see the arachnoid granulations on imaging sometimes. If you look at what that arrow is pointing to, that is an arachnoid granulation in the left transverse sinus. Very recently, I got a call from an ER doctor when I was on call saying, hey, I got this patient. I think she has migraine. She's getting better. But the radiologist is concerned that there could be a dural venous thrombosis. And I said, hold on a second, let me log in. And I saw an image very similar to this one. And I said, no, 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 the, the radiologist has lost their mind. You can go ahead and send this patient home. So do be careful of this. It can look quite impressive as shown in this image sometime. Now, there are a lot of different spinal fluid tests that we can do. We can test for autoimmune diseases. We can test for infections. We can test for rare neurotransmitter deficiencies and other things as well. Of course, you don't care about all those tests you're interested in how we can use this to diagnose multiple sclerosis. 
So the multiple sclerosis panel is actually a cerebrospinal fluid test, a spinal tap, and a blood test done together. And we try to do them at roughly the same time, ideally within a few hours, just because your antibody production, production can vary significantly even day to day. So really this test should be done the same day. And there are a lot of different components such as the oligoclonal bands, which is kind of the key test, and I'll show you pictures of that, but a lot of other tests as well. And we also send standard studies such as the cell count, glucose, protein, and sometimes culture. The key finding that is suggestive of multiple sclerosis is having one or more than one oligoclonal band that is unique to the spinal fluid. In other words, two or more bands that are in the cerebrospinal fluid, but not in the blood. But there are some other findings that can help suggest a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, such as elevated immunoglobin G synthesis and immunoglobin G index. And these are complicated formulas based on other proteins that are synthesized. And sometimes we can see elevated myelin basic protein, which is a component of myelin during an acute relapse. Now, thinking more about oligoclonal bands, again, greater than two oligoclonal bands only in the cerebrospinal fluid, not in the blood, is seen in about 90% of people with multiple sclerosis. But I should say that the diagnosis of MS isn't just based on this. There are false positives and false negatives. So this is really used to confirm a suspected diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. One thing I should note is sometimes we'll see oligoclonal bands that are in the serum or blood and cerebrospinal fluid, but this is not the typical finding seen in multiple sclerosis and is often benign or insignificant, but it can also be seen in some other diseases such as systemic autoimmune diseases with CNS manifestations such as Sjogren's syndrome with neurological side effects. I also note that uh, certain types of diseases, such as acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or ADEM, can show bands, but they actually go away. So if you did a spinal tap during the acute attack, you'll see bands, but if you test it six months later, it will usually normalize. Also, the disease neurosarcoidosis, in other words, sarcoidosis with neurological manifestations, can usually has no bands, but you can see an elevated immunoglobin G index. And there are other diseases that can have abnormal findings, such as neuromyelitis optica, about 20 to 30% of those individuals have oligoclonal bands unique to CSF. So it's not a perfectly specific finding. Now, this isn't the best picture, but this is sort of what oligoclonal bands look like. And if you look on the right, that's supposed to be abnormal, where you see these distinct bands that are not present in the plasma. Again, this isn't the best picture, but you can see that they aren't found in the normal image to the left. So I'd like to know, have you had a spinal tap? What were the results? And do you have any other questions about spinal tap or cerebrospinal fluid testing in general?